Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist and I study the mind and brain in its physical and cultural context. Meaningful coincidences like synchronicity and serendipity provide clues to how our minds and our brains connect deeply to our bodies, other people, nature, and our environment. Meaningful coincidences occur in all aspects of human life. You just need to expect them. I'm the founder of the Coincidence Project. The Coincidence Project is composed of 15 coincidence ambassadors who are synchronicity experts from around the world. Each coincidence ambassador has appeared on the show. Our, prim our primary mission is to encourage you to tell each other your coincidence stories. Why? Because synchronicities illuminate the invisible currents that connect and unify us. Yes, synchronicities illuminate the invisible currents that connect and unify us. You can join us, the Coincidence Ambassadors, on Clubhouse, which is primarily an audio-only conversation platform. You can download the Clubhouse app to your phone. Our club, The Coincidence Project, meets every Friday for an hour, beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Come visit us. Tell us your coincidence stories. That's 1 p.m. Fridays on Clubhouse. Our, our guest today is a remarkable man uh, who I've had the opportunity of speaking with before. Uh, he's Dean Radin. Uh, and Dean is chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and associate distinguished professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He is, I think, the preeminent researcher in telepathy, psychokinesis, and other psi phenomenon. He speaks with us from Boise, Idaho. Welcome to the show, Dean. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, as I like to start off with, what's your tell us one of your favorite coincidence stories? You told me a great one once before, but what what else you got? So uh, I don't know if I mentioned before about finding someone to analyze EEG data. No, you didn't. Okay, so about fifteen years ago, I was doing a project where we were working on this uh, experimental paradigm that I call presentiment. And the idea is to look for precognitive uh, effects before something happens, but to look at it in physiology. So rather than ask somebody to try to outguess what the future is, you just look at their body in terms of skin conductance or pupil dilation or a variety of other measures to see whether the unconsciously the body is going to respond to some future event. So we did an experiment involving long-term meditators who are doing a style called non-dual meditation, like Dzogchen. And we presented very simple stimuli, either a, a little light flash or a little audio beep, so, so as to not disrupt their meditative state. And we took 32 channels of EEG on them. And we're going to look for, to see whether the brain would respond before these simple stimuli occurred. We also had controls who had never meditated before the same age and gender. So, and you have some data to suggest that presentiment does seem to reflect uh, brain activity. Brain activity can precede the conscious acknowledgement of it. Right. So a, from a conventional perspective, it's, mm -hmm. it's well understood that the brain has all kinds of interesting anticipatory responses to it. But that's when you know what might happen. In this case, the light flashes and the audio tones are completely random. So nobody knows in advance what's going to happen. 
So it you can't infer what's about to happen. And if there's going to be a presentiment, yeah, the brain and the body and the heart and everything else would respond in some way because it's a stimulus. So anyway, so we, we did a 32 channel EEG measurements on all these people. We ended up with a ton of data and I, I could do the analysis myself, but I figured what I'd really want is somebody who is an expert in this. And the package that is most used in the academic world is called EEG Lab, which is based on MATLAB, which is a scientific computing platform. And it's free, which is one of the other reasons I wanted it. It's very good and it's free. So I figured maybe I could find a graduate student somewhere who would be willing to do it for the analysis for free or maybe for a small amount of money. And my assistant at the time said, no, what, what do you really want? You want some grad student to do this or, or you know, what, it, what, well, so I said, well, I want somebody who's an expert in this to volunteer their time to do this. So she said, okay, just keep that in mind. One week later, I get an email from somebody who is not just an expert, but the person who wrote that software package and continues to develop it through, it's through uh, University of California at San Diego as an appointment there. So he contacted me and said, well, I saw you gave a talk a couple of years ago and I'm very interested in what you do. Is there any way I can help? And so I said, well, yeah, there is something. I, I have all this data and I'm not quite sure what to do with it. So not only did he come and help and become a co-author on that publication, he has now been on the staff at where I work at IONS for, for almost the past 15 years. <laughs> Well, you told me what I will say is a similar story in that you imagine the kind of laboratory you wanted to have. Uh, and this was in Silicon Valley. And you rented a place finally. And then you've discovered that on the other side of the wall of your, of your research lab was a guy setting up a research lab that had all the stuff that you wanted to have in it. Yeah. No, and, and crazier than that, that the, the, when I finally introduced myself to him and he opened the door, it, it looked like he had a stroke or something because he was really shocked. And I learned then that he was doing an affirmation exercise using a Tibetan dream yoga method to manifest me, meaning he wanted me to show up. He wanted me to contact him in some way. I had no idea who this person was. Uh, and it, so it turns out that he wanted to contact me and I opened the door and there I was. That's why he was so shocked. And so we were doing like, like a dual affirmation. I was affirming or at least visualizing what it was that I wanted to have in, in our laboratory. And he was trying to visualize me at the same time that we're both doing this like for a month at the same time. And then boom, the, the two affirmations get pulled together and we're literally right next to each other. Well, part of the fun for for me and I think for you is to like, how does this work? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the way I think of it, especially in that episode, which is so strange, is that uh, something about strong intention acts metaphorically like gravity. It, it pulls things into your orbit or it probabilistically changes events in such a way so that if you imagine that you're moving through uh, space and time and this huge probabilistic branching structure where at every moment you can decide to do this versus that. And sometimes it's a bigger decision, sometimes less, but nevertheless, it's like a, a whole set of probabilities marching in front of you. So if, if you have a strong intention, it's almost as though you can steer yourself through that, that branching structure. So this of course is raising the question of, is there free will or not? Is the future fixed or not? Is it faded or not? All those kinds of questions immediately come to the surface. And the kind of work that I do essentially is an exercise in planned synchronicities, which, which doesn't, sounds like a paradox, but every time we do an experiment involving a psychokinetic effect or precognition or whatever it happens to be, we are creating in the lab a, a, a minor version of what in the real world somebody would probably call a synchronicity. 
And the basic one of the basic forms of synchronicity is mind matching environment, uh, thought, feeling, thought, image matching environment. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a mirroring. Uh, I've gotten into a, a book about narcissism. Uh, it's called Portrait of a Mirror, and in this one, uh, it's uh, the simple idea is you as you put as put two mirrors facing each other. And these flat surfaces, if you put something in between them, become infinitely deep. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a world we live in. There is a lot of reflection going on in our minds, in our environment. And even children, little children, uh, six months old, love looking at their own photographs. Uh, and they fall in love with them sometimes, like narcissists in the in the myth uh, falls in love with the reflection in his pond. So th there's something about mind and environment and reflection, which is not reflection on your own mind ex only, it's reflection in the outside world. So mm -hmm. when, when you ask the question of free will, there is an element in there in the probability field that you just described that allows you to choose where you have the freedom to choose. Right. So some say that you have the appearance of free will. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to decide, well, where does the appearance end and the reality begin? Uh, I think we have to behave as though we have free will. That's how all of our laws <laughs> are, are constructed. Uh, on the other hand, there are also experiments uh, in, in my line of work to see whether or not somebody else's intention can influence your behavior. And the, the simple version of this is called the uh, facil remote facilitation of attention experiment. It's a little bit like a Jedi mind trick. And so the way it works is uh, you, you take a, a subject in an experiment and their task is to watch a candle flame. And every time that they notice that their mind has wandered, they press a button. So it's a way of, of indirect way of measuring how, how attentive you are. And everyone's mind's gonna wander after a while. So, uh, so you have then periods uh, where somebody is watching you on a closed circuit TV connection, where when you show up on the screen, they intently help you pay attention to the task. So they're mentally focusing on you with the idea of improving your attention. And then there's times when that the image goes away and the person's asked to think about something else. So you don't know when the other person is trying to help you or not by, by the design of the experiment. But the question is, will you have less mind wandering when somebody's trying to facilitate your attention than not? And the answer is yes. So that means that what you think you're doing is, is like it, it's completely sovereign to you you know, your world stops somehow around the envelope of your body, but these kinds of experiments say no. And there's lots of other experiments looking at not attentional effects, but simply physiological effects. And there too, the evidence is pretty strong that if somebody is staring at you and trying to mentally agitate you and you don't know when, nevertheless, your body does become agitated. So, and this, this becomes uh, something like uh, healing at a distance. Well, these are analogs of healing because yeah. it's really difficult to, to measure healing responses quickly. But if you can see a physiological change, then yeah, in principle, it says that something like healing at a distance is possible. Yeah, and then voodoo becomes a real thing too. Uh, when... Yeah, we, we actually did a study on voodoo. Tell uh, us about it. Years ago. Well, the the... The jargon in the field is called a DMILS experiment, D-M-I-L-S, meaning distant mental interactions with living systems. It used to be called bio-PK, but it's the same idea. It's the idea that you, you can mentally influence biology at a distance. So, and a DMILS paradigm is very similar to what I just mentioned. It's the, the classic is feeling of being stared at. So you're sitting in a room, basically doing nothing other than relaxing. There's a camera looking at you. And typically in 30 second or one minute periods, the camera is on or off. And there's no indication of what it is for the subject. Meanwhile, the image is carried to somebody else who 
when the camera is on, they intently stare at you without actually any intention at all. It's just staring, the feeling of being stared at. And the, the question is, does physiology change depending on what condition is going on? The answer is yes, it does. So if somebody's staring at you, you become typically sympathetic arousal starts happening. So what we did was we said, well, what else could we do that, that would use a, a more of a ritual circumstance rather than steering? And so we decided that voodoo was a pretty good way. So we had each person make a little doll. We got a, like a plain doll and then you, you would color it and put bits of hair in it and you would make it you, essentially. It's your effigy. And even a, like a little biography that you'd, you'd stick on its stomach. And then we all decided that we, we didn't want to do this experiment where uh, you could put pins in the doll because no one wanted to be hurt. So the only thing you could do with the other person's doll, like if I was the person trying to influence you, I would have your effigy and I could only calm it down. So typically by, by stroking the head or massaging it or something like that, something that would be calming. And so our prediction was that during those periods, the, the one minute periods where the, the, the sender or the, the voodoo person was trying to calm you, they would be doing something to your doll. Otherwise they would set it aside. And then we'd look at the, see if the physiology changed as a result. So we, we did that. Uh, this didn't involve any video cameras. It was simply watching the clock and doing the task at the right time. And we got very, very strong results that were a little bit uh, surprising. So we were, we were measuring uh, uh, blood volume pulse, uh, which is a correlate of blood pressure. You know, we use a photoplethysmograph on a fingertip to see that. So we have heart rate, an analog uh, or a correlate of blood pressure and also skin conductance. Those are the three measures that we had. So what we saw in uh, activity of the heart was a relaxation response, like more blood flowing into the fingertip would indicate a, a blood pressure, a parasympathetic response. But for the skin conductance, we saw a rise in skin conductance, which is a sympathetic response. So we thought, well, that's strange. You're getting a parasympathetic and a sympathetic response at the same time. Only when the, you, the person was messing around with the doll, with the effigy. So we, we were puzzled with that. We didn't know what to think of it. So we did a replication and got the same kind of result. And then we thought, well, maybe, why don't we just put the person on the table, the actual person on a massage table, and then have the one of the people who was using the effigy do on the person what they did with the effigy. And when you do that, you find what massage therapists have known forever, which is you have a relaxation response, a parasympathetic response in the body, but you also have a sympathetic response because you're touching the skin. And so this paradoxical response, which we didn't understand actually does make sense. And what it, from a massage perspective, an even more strange response to this was that we're seeing that effect with somebody touching an effigy of you. The same thing that you get if you're actually touching the person. So we thought then that the, the, the stories about voodoo, that, that you push a pin and the person feels hurt right where the pin is, that was kind of in alignment with what we saw in this experiment. And it, it kind of creeped us out. And so we never did it again. <laughs> So, you know, most of the time we're very comfortable as scientists when we get a statistically significant effect that's not like outrageously big because then it's not scary. But if you get something that is actually quite a, a large response and is suggestive of what we have heard about from what shamans can do, that was like, that was a little bit too much. And it pushed our own boggle threshold beyond <laughs> some threshold. <laughs> beyond some threshold it, it became too powerful uh, a possibility and you wanted to be yeah. careful with it. you want to be careful yeah. with it i'm i'm a psychotherapist and I, i've continued to believe that it's important for the patient's well-being that i have an image of what that patient's better future might be mm -hmm. how it might be for them and what you're doing is confirming that that kind of imagining and it's not just imagining it's the energy going between me and another person that conveys some of that 
idea. So this is a more abstract level and in person, uh, and also could be separate of the same idea of calming somebody at a distance, but in their presence. Uh, that will also have an effect. What do you think of that? Well, in, and in the case of psychotherapy, not only in the person's presence, and of course there, as you well know, the just nonverbal behavior alone can act as either a, a stimulus or a relaxing response. Uh, but you're probably thinking about the clients too. So even when they're not around, if you're reviewing a case, you are having an influence on them. So if you're reviewing a case and you're really worried about it and agitated and whatever, they're going to feel that at some unconscious level. And when you, you expand this out, not just to a therapeutic case, but every interaction among people, which is happening all the time, that's kind of scary too, because now we're seeing an interconnection among all people, probably all creatures, maybe even the physical world that is constantly being buffeted around all the time. So again, raises the question of our feeling of internal sovereignty, uh, free will mostly is true, I think, but there are lots and lots of subtle interactions that are going on with others as well. And I've tried to suggest that there are, that we do have free will. Uh, and, and as uh, Isaac Bacibus Singer said, I, I have no choice to believe that I have free will. It's a, mm. that kind of like playing with it, but it's a limited version other than do I have it or not? Because it's in between somewhere and we've got to right. learn to deal with the continuum because people like polarities all the time. And we've got to be able to like say, you know, maybe this way, maybe, it's a continuum of the same idea. So some of what we're talking about here is that we can influence other people and we do. One of the things you heard me say about the Coincidence Project is that coincidences illuminate the invisible connections, the invisible currents among and between us that unite us. It also, as you're saying, it also can spread us apart too. Mm -hmm. But these, we do influence each other and somehow, I don't know, I didn't get the last time I talked with you, but you're describing almost Ender's web there's like a, you're having a picture of a web of a web like something, energy patterns that our minds are each nodes in that go out from it to influence other minds as well as those other minds are influencing us. That's the picture mm -hmm. I get from listening to you describe it. Yeah. So the Ender's net as a metaphor is a very good one. Uh, and so we, we've had a, an experiment going for 23 years that is still ongoing called the Global Consciousness Project, which is, is studying one of the implications of all of this interconnection between people and among people, but also the environment at large. And so that, I don't know, have, have you, have I talked about this or have someone else talked about this project before? Of your... course, of course, but not in a long time. I mean, I, I knew it okay. when it was, yeah. So one of the reasons I bring it up is because I'm, I'm right now in the midst of uh, doing a new analysis of the data, because we have 23 years of this data uh, where we have random number generators. These are electronic devices. I, I can show you one. I think I have one over here. So here, here's an example of a pretty fancy random number generator. This one's based on a quantum mechanical event. Uh, and most of them are, this one's, based on photons and how they, how they behave when they hit a mirror. But there are lots of other quantum indeterminate events that can be used in these devices to produce sequences of random bits. So we have these in major cities around the world. Every second, they, they uh, create a sample. And then every five minutes, they send all of the samples up to a single server. So it's been running since 1998. Uh, we have a ton of data at this point. And the idea of it was, uh, if everything really is interconnected, kind of along the lines of something like dual aspect monism or neutral monism as a philosophy, where mind and matter are not dualistic, they're not separate, they're more like two sides of the same coin. So they're, they're intimately interconnected. If that is true, then during unusual periods in human history where hundreds of millions or perhaps a billion people are all paying attention to the same thing at the same time, then maybe the physical world changes. Because if you have this tight 
connection between mind and matter, then a huge amount of sudden coherence occurring among minds, maybe there's coherence occurring among matter at the same time. So we use random number generators because by definition, those are maximum entropy events. They have no order in them at all. So if coherence arises over here, then maybe it'll arise in the randomness too. It'll become less random. So the, the formal experiment was 500, ex the 500 events, big events like 9-11 is an example. Uh, and then you look at, the, look at the data associated with those periods and it, it accumulated to a seven sigma deviation from expectation. Which is huge, chance. which is huge. Yeah, it, it's associated with odds against chance of three trillion to one. So very little chance that this was just a fluke, but something about the physical world changed during large scale events. Okay, you look at the 23 years of data, those 500 events constituted about 5% of the 23 years, because these events generally took place over a couple of hours over a given day. So 95% of the data is just random data. But it raises a question, well, what happens about all the events we didn't happen to measure? There are lots of events happening all the time. And even worse than that, we know because of previous experiments that if you take a small group of meditators and you put a random number generator in their vicinity, more often than not, you get a deviation from chance. So you don't need a worldwide experiment. You can see similar effects at a very small scale, which means there's an uncountable number of influences that presumably are happening all the time. And so it raises the question, which was Einstein's complaint about quantum mechanics, maybe God doesn't play dice with the universe, right? He says, no, God doesn't play dice with the universe. He didn't like quantum indeterminism, which is considered fundamental now in terms of the way science works. So this project suggests that too, that maybe what looks like a random event actually is the result of billions of minds that are normally not in alignment. They're, you know, they're, if you imagine each one's pointing in a given direction, they're randomly pointing all over the place. And so the physical world is being randomized on average. So for years, we never knew what to do with that because the only thing you could do is look for the random walk over time and look for a, like a spike and then look in something, did something happen in the world when that spike occurred? Well, most of the time you'd never know. So I've been working on this issue for quite a while and I finally came up with two different kinds of analyses to look at the entire database to see whether it's a random walk or not. And so what only one that I'll mention because it's a little bit easier to describe, it's called uh, multi-scale entropy analysis. And this is now, it, it, it's fairly new. It was first paper published on this was uh, 2005, I think, but it's being used in many, many cases now where you have a time series of data. So biological systems, the stock market, you name it, all kinds of things where you have series of things happening over time. And what this analysis does, it says, whenever you have a time series of anything, uh, you can characterize it in terms of entropy. It's the amount of, inf in this case, uh, the entropy meaning the amount of information in the signal. So if it's a very random signal, you can think of it that it's very complex, crazy complex. If you think, uh, how could we compress this signal, like make a JPEG out of an original photograph? That's a compression. Well, you can do the same thing with any form of information, but you can't compress a truly random signal. So you can think of it then as having an enormous amount of information in it. We can't squish it. So. That's what this analysis does. It looks at different time scales. Like, so you get a chunk of data, maybe 20,000 samples going to be of anything. And you can do an analysis for the entire thing. The, can, can we compress this? And now you do it, okay, let's chop it in little bits now. Can we compress those pieces and chop it in smaller effects? So we're looking at different time scales and seeing whether the information there can be compressed or not. And that tells you something about information at different scales. And so I, I use this on the random data coming out of this 23 year experiment. And sure enough, the, the actual data from the Global Consciousness Project shows structure at many different scales, temporal structure, which if you take exactly the same data and you just randomly scramble the order, 
So you destroy the temporal sequence, but the mean, the variance, all of those measurements are exactly the same. You don't see that order. So what this tells me is that uh, Einstein may have been right, that what looks like it's completely random actually is not completely random and it is being affected to some degree, statistically to a pretty strong degree, but still magnitude small by, by consciousness, by the, the movements of uncountable numbers of consciousness. Yeah, I, I've developed this I, I name the psychosphere which is like the geosphere and the biosphere. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's a it's an it's our mental atmosphere that, that surrounds us here on Earth and is composed of all the elements that you're implying, not just our minds, but uh, nature in all its forms, as well as perhaps uh, inanimate objects in a slower vibrational way. So mm -hmm. that we are in a field that uh, as you're implying is has a probability field in it there's a probability field in it but the basic parts of it is that we give information and energy into it and we get information and energy from it continuously mm -hmm. interacting with this without really knowing about it simultaneous independent discoveries are a simple example of that, that now the Global Consciousness Project is showing in a much more uh, elaborate way is that our minds are much more connected than we think they are. So I have this idea that um, maybe, uh, Dean, maybe we've got a little problem here on Earth, like uh, maybe uh, humanity uh, is slowly committing suicide by our behavior on our, on our home on our habitat. Well, the history of Homo sapiens is the history of war. And it's, it's no different now than it has ever been. And, and so you think, well, well why are we as a, as a species so aggressive? Uh, some people say, well, it's because men are primarily the ones who are aggressive. And there it's because we have too much testosterone or maybe not too much. We have exactly the right amount of, of testosterone, but it makes people very agitated then become agitated with this, which is why you need sports like boxing and shooting and things like that to kind of get the agitation away rather than attacking other people. And a case could be made from an evolutionary point of view that you need that kind of, I mean, that it, it, in a survival sense for a species to survive, it has to be aggressive because something else is going to eat you otherwise. And so you take a combination of high aggression and, and relatively clever creatures, and here we are. And so, you know, it, it, it's true that we, we now have the capacity to eradicate ourselves in a way that we, we couldn't do 50 years ago. And we, would, we were trying really hard to eradicate ourselves, but we didn't have the capacity. Now we do have that capacity. And so, you know, like step away from the earth and look back at it and say, well, I wonder if these creatures are actually gonna survive. And, one of the things that you can then ask similarly is, well, where are all the aliens? Part of the Fermat's paradox. You know, where, where if, if life can arise everywhere, some of it's gonna be intelligence and there's so many capabilities out there, a lot of it's gonna be intelligent and a lot older than us. So where are they? Well, so now finally the government admits that they're UFOs. We don't really know what they are. We don't know if it's ET or not, but even if it was, it still seems relatively, calm out there. Like SETI's been trying to pick up TV channels from, I don't know, from sitcoms from Andromeda or something. I don't know what they're trying to get, but they haven't found those signals yet. And, and we, I mean, realistically, we have hardly looked at anything that these are small projects, but uh, it doesn't look like, like we're saturated with other creatures out there, maybe because in order for a species to get up to the point where we are now, they generally don't survive. They make themselves go extinct because the, about the only civilization I can imagine that we would be able to kind of grok would be ones that is somewhat similar to the level of advancement that we are currently at now. Because if they're way beyond that, if you have a civilization that's a million years beyond us, we wouldn't have even the beginning of understanding what's going on there. I, like I, I've written in my most recent book here that uh, 
that the likelihood that physical methods would be used for space travel, for communication, for all that is extremely low. Like if we're uh, like on the, on the edge of beginning to understand a little bit about consciousness can do, they would be way beyond that. So they, they're traveling mentally. They can, I mean, can do things which we would consider to be completely magical because we don't understand it. Uh, and, and so maybe they are here. They're all here. Like all of the, every creature in the universe has been watching us. We would never be able to detect it. Well, there are many reports that seem reliable. And I interviewed a guy a couple of weeks ago uh, about uh, contactees. And the data is pretty solid from what I hear from him. But that's mm -hmm. yet another subject. I ask him, so if they're around here, how come they're not telling us how we can manage the situation we're putting ourselves in? And he says, one problem is we're too aggressive. Uh, they're they're scared of us. We might blow them up or something. Uh, you don't give a baby a bomb. Yeah. You don't give a baby a bomb. <laughs> That's what we've got. Uh, on the other hand, I said, how do we get them to tell us what we need to do? And I didn't get much of an answer on that. And this is what I'm trying to be able to connect with your ideas about the Global Consciousness Project and what you're talking about. Much clearer to me now, Indra's web is real. Uh, that I think the the web uh, is a the World Wide Web, the internet is kind of a a structure that's a scaffolding for our own ability to be able to communicate with each other in mental ways, in emotional mm -hmm. mental ways. But we mm -hmm. now have it, and you're making it so clear, Dean, so clear in the way you not only are describing it, but what's beyond your descriptions this Indra's net of these all these connections among and between us i'm trying to imagine and you know einstein like to say that imagination is our most powerful capacity that we have that and it's people are trying to corporations trying to commandeer that but what i'm imagining is a collective human organism so that we're not just organized around uh, the death of Princess Diana, but we're organized intentionally, much like you're talking about, to be able to intentionally recognize that we are all part of the same thing, that we each have different roles to play in it, and that we need to find our roles in separately, we're cells in this organism, as well as how we contribute to the whole. How does that fit with your thinking? Well, I've just, uh, I've, I'm a co-author of a TV series, a science fiction TV series based on this theme. And it, it is a uh, antidote to stories about hive mind because most of those stories portray the hive mind as in Invasion of the Body Snatchers and the Borg on Star Trek and many other examples that this is the most horrific thing ever. That if, if you become absorbed into the hive mind, you're no longer, your, your ego is dissolved and that's horrible. Well, I don't think that actually would be the case. In fact, I, I would propose that for humanity to evolve into its next stage, it has to be a hive mind. It must be because individually, we've very clearly shown we, we can't do anything. That I mean, like everyone recognizes, at least some do, that the climate is now attacking us because we've been bothering it for a long time. And yet, like I said, nothing is happening as a result. Right. And there are many other examples like that. There's there's existential threats that are that are compounding. And I mean, it's it's so frustrating to, to see articles come out in science and nature about what the, what's going to happen with the climate if we don't do this. Well, there's no evidence that anybody's interested in that. I mean, there's talk about it, but there's not much activity. So how do we get out of that? It suggests that uh, if we were able to advance our, our basic nature, probably genetic nature, so that we were more aware of this interconnection. And it, it doesn't require full-blown telepathy or something like that, but just having a, a greater immediate sense of the interconnectedness between people and the environment, then you wouldn't have to have discussions in Congress about how we're gonna use the money to, to fix this. It would just be like, of course you're gonna do this. It wouldn't be a question. But I think that would require an evolutionary change. It's like in our current state, it's not gonna happen. 
So the story that I wrote does talk about an evo a genetic change that is that happens and is part of the story. And a hive mind is created and the hive mind becomes its own entity. Yeah. And the way that it describes what has happened is if you look at an individual neuron in your brain, it's pretty clever, but it also has a certain sense of sovereignty. It has no idea what's going on with 100 billion other neurons, nor would it even have a conception that this gives rise to something else. Well, the same is true for us. If you have 8 billion nodes with a huge number of interconnections, and they're, they're a little bit aware of each other, something will emerge out of that. What emerges out of that ultimately in the story is Gaia. The planet becomes aware. So we individually, we know that we have various kinds of psychic abilities. They're relatively weak most of the time. We have synchronicities. We have these strange experiences. At a planetary scale, they're much, much, much bigger and stronger. And that's how we get out. That's, that's how we, we uh, graduate essentially into a next phase of existence. So the closest other story like this that I know is Arthur C. Clarke's story, Childhood's End. I love that book. It's his, yeah. To me, that's his best. Yeah. So th this is like, it's, it's a modern version of that story, but puts a scientific basis on how it would actually happen. And the reason why I, I wrote it is because I'm co-founder of a company that is working on methods of doing genetic manipulation of the brain. Wow. So we, we, we can do that now. Well, Non-invasive gen neuronal genetic changes in the brain. I'm, I'm a epigenetics kind of guy too, uh, for various reasons that our environment influences our gene expression. And I, I see synchronicity as an aspect of what you just described, where individuals start noticing that they're part of a greater whole. That's the mm -hmm. whole purpose of the coincidence project is what you're talking about. And I think that in parallel, from the mind perspective, the genetic changes that you're talking about can take place with increasing synchronicity awareness, with increasing mm -hmm. ability to see how things are connected, how I am connected, how we are connected, and study those currents and how they work so that we can participate in it in, in, as, as a global consciousness entity. That's why I use the term co collective human organism, because we are. We are, and yeah. the hive mind is part of this organism, but it's not just a mind, it tromps on the earth. It's a body that is destroying stuff and keep must go down and deep into the oceans and want take off mountaintops. We can't keep doing this. Gaia is getting mad at us and we're destroying our habitat. So I'm trying to see how you might think of meaningful coincidences as fitting in to the kind of genetic changes you're talking about. Well, I, the, the notion is, uh, is based on a very small scale study we did on people who say that they're psychic and come from families who are psychic. So this is folklore that you find everywhere in the world. Oh yeah. And so we decided, okay, let's use modern genomic methods to get the DNA from such people and compare it against people who are not psychic and don't come from psychic families and see if there's a difference. Well, we found a difference. Uh, it, it turned out it was in the intron sequence, not in the exome. So it is not the protein coding portion of, the, of DNA, it's the epigenetic portion, almost like a switch that gets turned on in some people and it's not turned on in other people. So that gave us a glimmering at this point. We, we need to do a much larger scale study to confirm this, but if it turns out to be right, then it suggests that there, there is something, maybe epigenetic, and probably m many more things that we haven't found at this point uh, that will cause uh, morphological changes in the brain. And so far, the one that has kind of popped up is uh, the connection, the fiber connections between the uh, the caudate and the putamen, like old, old structures in the brain. Some people who have very high density, uh, five to 10 times higher density connecting those two structures, uh, report 
contacts with ETs, psychic phenomena, they can see things other people can't see and so on. So they're perfectly normal by every other test, except that they report these kinds of things. And they have this brain structure and it's bilateral, it's not a lesion, and it runs in families. So we're thinking, okay, that suggests a genetic difference in these people. Uh, we're finding an intron sequence, it's probably one of many biomarkers. So there's, and you look way back in, in history, there was at least one channeler back in the 50s who said, in the future, our scientists will discover that the caudate is an antenna for what she called higher sense perception. And so, all right, you know, where did that come from? She actually named the caudate. And traditionally, if you look in, into the uh, neuroscience literature about like, where does intuition come from? How do you get these strange connections it points back to the caudate. So caudate seems to be involved with uh, a richer form of interconnection of the information that, that is in or around the brain. And I mean, that would be where we'd start targeting. So we have a way of getting CRISPR edits into the brain. You, you know about CRISPR, presumably. No? Yes. Explain, explain it for our audience. CRISPR is uh, uh, the inventors of CRISPR uh, got the Nobel Prize last year, uh, and it's a uh, it's one of a number of ways of doing gene editing, and it's uh, more precise than previous methods. And there are new methods that are coming along every day, which allow for things like uh, if you look on uh, clinicaltrials.gov, there's roughly sixty trials that are currently underway using these gene editing methods for treatment of things like sickle cell anemia and Parkinson's and so on. It's a very effective way of treating genetic disorders. But the flip side is you can also do things with genetics that we couldn't do before, which raises all kinds of ethical issues. You, we can make augmented humans. And one of the, so in that you go in that direction, it raises the possibility of genetically augmenting intuition, which is a slight euphemism for genetically augmenting psychic connections, including telepathy. So in the story, I mean, there is a company now that we're doing this, but we're focusing at this point on mental health, not on augmentation, because among other things, it's much easier to work on something like anxiety and depression than it is on something that we don't even know if it's real yet, but we think it is. So cognitive enhancement is in our future, but I follow that thread in the story and say that, okay, sometime 10 years from now, people are no what portion of the brain to start augmenting and they do it and the hive mind begins to emerge. Um, I, I'm enjoying hearing you being so biological uh, in all of this because I, I mean, I, I, I studied the relationship between mind and brain for a long time, trying to figure out how that works as a psychotherapist. I was able to see that you can do cognitive therapy and depression and get similar responses in the brain as you get from doing antidepressants with the brain. They're not all the same, but they're very similar. So the, the brain can be influenced by both the pharmacological and psychological means. So mm -hmm. the more we talk about this for psychosphere, the, the Indra's net, the consciousness that we're all part of, the more I think that mind influences body, and you, you will believe that too. So my take on this, my approach to it, is to use these mental experiences, mental emotional experiences of synchronicity to augment that caudate capacity, particularly the density of fibers between the caudate and putamen, that I think you can practice that, by, and that'll keep happening, so that you'll, if you have more and more synchronicities, you'll have more and more synchronicities, and that's what people report. So I'm coming at it from a more psychological perspective, and you're coming at it from, uh, an, epige from an epigenetic. I love the idea of there's there's a there's a button you can push to make it happen. I mean, it's it's too simple. We know we can't really talk like that, but maybe it isn't that simple. But it, you just flip it over, or you have to take a little while to move the button. It's not just a button. It's kind of like a thing you got to like dial up to make happen, and then get it stuck in the right place. Right. So the the reason that we're focusing on anxiety and depression beginning 
with later dementia and Alzheimer's and other very difficult things to treat uh, is because if somebody's in a state of chronic anxiety or chronic depression, that a certain amount of psychotherapy will help, but it may not be able to push them enough into a direction where they're able to start doing that. So this is why SSRIs and other drugs are prescribed to like get people into a state where they can start doing psychotherapy. That's right. So we, we were analyzing, well, what is the mechanism of action in SSRIs? Do you know? <laughs> Supposedly serotonin reuptake inhibition, yes. Right. Okay. So it's down-regulating the activity of neurons that are responding to serotonin, ultimately. That's what it does. So we thought, well, how can we do that directly? Like, Because SSRIs, as you well know, have all kinds of horrible side effects if you don't do it right. So we said, well, maybe we can directly affect the 5-HT2A receptors in the neurons, in the brain, because basically with, with CRISPR or other editing tools, you can affect anything in the body. So, okay, we figured out a way of, of down-regulating activity of 5-HT2A. Well, let's, let's, keep sure enough, five, let's keep those 5-HT2A ones in mind, because if I remember right, that's where psilocybin and LSD have their effects. Yep, that is exactly right. So psilocybin, LSD, and some other psychedelics mimic serotonin. And when you flood too much serotonin in the brain, it responds by downregulating because it you know, wants to maintain homeostasis. So it, it causes a change, an epigenetic change in those very receptors. It's true. That's why psychedelics are now considered a good therapy as well. Very similar to SSRIs, but it has side effects too, right? So a lot of people are now trying to to, to remove the, uh, the hallucinogenic qualities of psychedelics so that the, the other aspects of it will still work and, and with some success in that direction. But we went further than that and said, no, we're just, we know it's 5-HT2A and maybe 1A, Let's downregulate that. So that's what we've created is an edit that will get into the brain non-invasively that will downregulate. And in, at least in our animal models so far, the experiments that we've done in mice, it does show it gets in the brain. It, it uh, causes a reduction in anxiety using the gold standard method for measuring that in mice. Uh, and the, we basically have proof of principle at this point that you can do this. And in mice, we're using DNA because it's, it's easy, but in humans, we would use RNA. So it's, it would essentially be an epigenetic push into the person, which would like probably for a matter of weeks or months, put them down into a state where they're able to do other kinds of therapies. And so their anxiety will significantly decrease, depression will significantly decrease, and then they'll be able to take on the next step. This this is wonderful news from you, Dean. Hearing what you're doing, uh, it's you'll think you'll think hive mind. Uh, I'll think uh, collective human uh, organism. Uh, it's got to it's got to have a hive mind in order to be walking around down here. That's my part in it, and I'm doing this from a psychological synchronicity perspective. You're going from the genetic epigenetic place of doing it, but it's all mind and brain and, and mind and environment. And there have to be more people than us thinking like this. There have to be. That's just the way the hive mind works. Yeah. We can't be the only one thinking like this. But we have to. We're going to end in a in a bit. But I I do have. Uh, my question about humanity and its aggressiveness, humanity uh, looking like uh, an alcoholic or somebody smoking cigarettes, where they kind of know there's a problem, but they're not ready to admit there's a problem until some go to AA and say, my name's Adam, and I'm an alcoholic. So mm -hmm. we, the, the CHO has to say, I am addicted to continuing material consumption. And I can't keep doing this because I'm destroying where I'm living. And I, I, I want to I, I see how you are in your way addressing that one, because it looks like there's a, our time span for doing something about that looks like it's getting narrower and narrower. Yeah, yep. <laughs> that's the one. So, I mean, there's an urgency around here. 
And that's what I'm asking you about how all this fits in your mind about how to, how to do something about this urgency. Yeah. So I, I think you're right that the, probably the majority of people on the planet who have the luxury of time to be able to think about such things, they do recognize that there's a problem. Some people are denying it and some people don't have the luxury of time and so on, but there, there are a lot of people. So uh, especially among the nonprofits that I know, they, they're doing what they know how to do. So they're, they're approaching it in very different ways. Where, where I work at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, in a sense, our mission has always been to be 20 years ahead of the rest of science. That, that's, that's what we're exploring. And so we have two parts. We have a science part, which is mainly what I'm involved in, which is looking at our the capacities of consciousness and interconnections, those kinds of things. We also have an experiential and educational component. And so the, uh, the way that I like to think of it is one that our, our, uh, one of our first presidents said, uh, Willis Harmon, which is that you're, you're walking along and you come across uh, a stream and there you see babies floating down the stream. And of course the initial impulse would be to jump in and save these babies. That's not what we do. What we do is find out why are there babies floating down the river in the first place? We go up river and find out what is, what's the cause of this obvious problem? Because the, the, the impulse is do fix this like right now, like, like we get rid of oil or something like that. It's much more complicated than that because the whole economy and everything else is all interconnected too. So we're looking at this point, primarily this we're dealing about an issue about the nature of consciousness. It's in many different ways. One is simply awareness of what's happening, like being mindful about what you're doing, how we're using plastic, all kinds of things that are at the time really good ideas, but the consequences weren't were not minimal. very well understood. And, and yeah. they're, it's still minimal given what we're doing as a species to the planet. Yeah. So Part of it is is awareness, mindfulness. Yeah, it's, aw it's awareness. Too. You can say there there are people who kind of know, but like the alcoholic who goes to the bar again. Yeah, I kind of know I got a problem. Or the cigarette smoker's wife's telling him he's got to like stop smoking. And yeah, I know, but I, I'm not I'm not going to do that. That's what I think we have a lot of. And maybe you know the work of Jim Prochaska and the stages of change in trying to help. Uh, drug addiction as well as other problems but we're in a pre-contemplative place where we kind of aren't thinking about it exactly but we haven't really contemplated what we need to do about it together and i am trying to suggest we need to do this together and evidence in a coordinate in a coordinated way with each of us contributing a part to the whole which has its own capacity like your tv show you it, it's going to be a greater consciousness each of us contributing to the whole and recognizing the greater consciousness of which we're a part with an intention to, to bring back the probability field you were talking about of try of making it happen that and how we do that i mean it's as you very well know it's very important to have the intention how you get there sometimes you don't know but that that's what we need to have the intention to reverse this thing that we've got and not just reverse be able to recognize what fun we could be having here on this playground called mother earth right in a sustainable way so unfortunately statisticians and others who work with data know very well that more and more evidence of a scientific type does not change anybody's mind just like somebody who's addicted, they know intellectually what they should do, but until you get a shot in the side of the head, that's a wake up call, behavior won't change. So I kind of suspect then that what's gonna happen is worse and worse and worse events. Like the coast will be flooded, there's gonna be more migration, there's gonna be worse, all kinds of things are gonna go bad. That's going to have to happen to a lot of people to get firsthand evidence that this is not normal. <laughs> and at that point, if we're lucky, there'll still be enough ca capacity to be able to do something about it. Because as we saw even long ago with the, the, the movie, um, An Inconvenient Truth, right? That it was kind of laughed at by a lot of people, except for ones who are actually paying attention. 
which was a, a minority, it takes personal experience to, to change behavior. Well, and, I, I want to be able to help people have a personal experience of something weird happening of the kind of stuff you're researching, which I mm -hmm. put under the global category of uh, meaningful coincidences that show us we are connected with each other. And then your data is so wonderful, Dean, about how we influence each other <laughs> without knowing it. And I use uh, simultaneous discoveries as a simple way of talking about that. But we mm -hmm. are all in this together in a way that synchronicities help people experience. And that's right. the experience I'm hoping for that's a softer version than a cataclysmic event saying, well, hey, wait a minute, there is something going on around here. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, it's true that uh, psychic experiences occur more when you're simply aware of them. Unfortunately, there, this is one of the reasons why I wrote this as a story, that the narrative that's associated with that is generally cast in negative terms. It's scary. It's horrific. You know, it's, it's demonic. And so if you have that pushing against this narrative, which is basically the only one that's going to save us, <laughs> well, that's why I wrote this story as an antidote to that, because it shows actually this is a very positive direction that we're you moving. Bet. This that's is a, not something to be scared about. That's so wonderful, Dean. It's so yeah. wonderful so, what you're doing there. I mean, let me tell you again, it's really wonderful what you're doing with that because we got to make it fun. I mean, it's fun to, to be having experiences like this, like you're going to be describing. So thank you very much for your, for your work on trying to convert in this polar place. We are always polarized, black and white, sun and, sun and dark and light. We've got that happening here all the time. So we got it yeah. again. And you are working against it. I'm with you, man. I am with you. I love what you're what you're planning, how you're thinking about it. Um, I'm on your team. So thank you very much for <laughs> talking with me so that I could get more optimistic myself and not just feel like I'm talking to a few people about it. You have got parallel ideas with what I'm working on. So thank you very much for, for a great conversation. You're welcome. Psychosphere is a mental atmosphere like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.